everybody it's jessica jones the cryptid huntress and boy am i glad that you guys are here with me tonight we have an incredible show tonight i have a new friend here in the studio tonight i have lance hightower of monster 911 podcast okay monster 911 podcast you guys please go check that out go subscribe over to his channel uh, you will not be disappointed. It's right up our alley. And I'm speaking for all of us over here at the Cryptid Hunters channel. All right. Today, we are going to be talking about the Alaska Triangle and all the enigmas within the Alaska Triangle, including the little people. Uh, that was tasked to me as a blind remote viewing target. And we're going to discuss that tonight uh, here on the show, amongst all the other strange things out of Alaska. Okay, so buckle up, you guys. We're in for a wild ride tonight. Okay, if you guys would like to follow along with all of my shows and everything I'm doing, I have a website. That's thecryptidhuntress.com. You can find all of my shows there and all of the events that I'm going to be speaking at. Uh, there's, there's plenty on there to keep you entertained for a little while. So you guys go check out my website. Uh, and it's a good way to get in touch with me. Also, if you'd like to follow along with the remote viewing data, and some extras, you can join my Patreon. That's the Cryptid Huntress over on Patreon. Shout out to all my members. I appreciate each and every one of y'all so much. Also, if you'd like to support the channel, support the Cryptid Huntress, I have a shop. It's over on Etsy. That's War Woman Goods. And yes, I do give out free merch that says the Cryptid Huntress on it to everyone who buys a package or who buys anything out of my shop. You get some free merch. Okay, so, uh, so go check that out if you feel like it. Also, the last line item of business here, I just started a Saturday night show. We're gonna be going live Saturday nights from here on out, 10 p.m. Eastern on this channel, The Cryptid Huntress. This weekend, I have Ryan Tremblay coming on. We're gonna be talking about the Wendigo and some other cryptids. There's one that I can't pronounce. Okay, sorry. But uh, but we're gonna be, it's Skinwalkers and Dogman and Wendigo. It's gonna be a like fantastic. I was going to say freaking fantastic time. It's going to be a freaking fantastic time. So please come and join me this Saturday night here. And of course, I'll be at space.radio Sunday night. Okay. All right. Well, let's get to our show because we have so much to talk about in so little time. Okay. All right. Well, let me give an overview to the audience as to what we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, the Alaska Triangle is also known as the, Berm it's almost like the Alaska Bermuda Triangle. It's a place of untouched wilderness in the frontier state where mystery lingers and people go missing at very high rates. Uh, it connects, the area connects the state's largest city of Anchorage in the south to Juneau in the southeast panhandle to Barrow, a small town on the state's north coast. Around 2,500 people go missing in Alaska each year. Many of them are going missing within the Alaska Triangle. There have been over 20,000 people that have gone missing there. Uh, at least, I think it's since the 1980s, y'all. I mean, it's a lot of people. Theories of where the missing people have gone include energy vortexes, extraterrestrials, wild animals, bad weather, geography, and cryptids such as the Kushtika and the Isiria people. Now, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing this right, okay? Um, the Isiria people are also known as Alaska's little people. The Ubik have in Syriates, um, that's what, that, that's, it's, they're little people, okay? They're a race of miniature human-like creatures with extraordinary powers. Stories suggest they live in different dimensions than ours, but can move in and out of our world easily. 
Despite their extraordinary powers, they share some similarities with humans. They're said to live deep underground, but are often spotted hunting and gathering and have a reputation as excellent craftsmen. They're known to lure hunters off the trail where they can cause them to meet an untimely demise. Now, on other shows, you guys will note that I have remote viewed the Alaska Triangle. Uh, I did the Black Pyramid, okay, and the Kushika. And, uh, but on this episode, we're looking into the little people. And to help me talk about the little people of Alaska tonight, I have Lance Hightower here. Uh, Lance has retired from healthcare. He was a chiropractor for 25 years. Uh, he had his first cryptid experience back when he was about 10 years old in eastern Oklahoma. And he and his brothers um, have had a lot of oddities happen. I believe he goes out and does field research with his brothers as well. He has an amazing podcast. It's called Monster 911, uh, where they help people with their paranormal encounters. It's been around for almost five or six years, probably longer than that, five or six years. Uh, they're formerly known as the Cryptid Brother Investigations of Oklahoma. And uh, please go to Monster 911 and subscribe. Please help me welcome to the show, Lance Hightower. Hey, Lance. Hi. How are you? Hey, thank you for, I am so excellent. Thank you so much for being here tonight. This is going to be an interesting show. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, I uh, always enjoy talking about um, cryptids, creatures, and just especially Alaska. I have to be honest, I didn't know a lot until we did the show back in 2019. Um, uh, the film company flew me up there and I was able to talk with a lot of the people, but it was just overwhelming the amount of paranormal um, events going on over there. Oh, I mean, I hear about so much craziness going on up there. And I do have a friend, our buddy Fred in Alaska has a fantastic channel. It's called Subarctic Alaska Sasquatch, where he tells the story of a lot of the locals up there with their hairy man encounters mm -hmm. and much more. He's actually come on my show several times to talk about the little people up there. And, yes. uh, and it's, they're very real. Uh, yeah. It's not just a mythological creature to the people who live up there. Right. Um, that's, uh, you know, one of many, but the little people was something that was new to me until, you know, when I went up there, I had an opportunity. I was given a lot of research on it to talk about it for the show. But then I was able to talk to uh, some um, some of the natives that live in the eastern part of uh, the Clinkets. And there was one I actually talked to one in the airport about the little people and then another one when we were out shooting. And basically, this gentleman, I'll just go into uh, quickly. He was on his snowmobile. And he's a local and he, uh, something happened with a snowmobile. Everybody's got a snowmobile. It was in winter and he was found the following day. Thank goodness he didn't, you know, perish of hyperthermia or anything, but he came back and had very little clothes on. And he came back with a story that he was lured into the woods deeper. He was miles away from his snowmobile and that the little people had lured him in the woods. He didn't know where the rest of his clothes were at. Uh, he was found by another snowmobile snowmobile person out running their trap line. And he was very descriptive on what they look like, that they had a song and they would stop and wave him this way, this way. And we're, and I asked, I said, like, how big are you talking about? And he said somewhere about gnome size. Um, you know, we're talking maybe about 24 inches high, something like that. And he spoke about them as common as you and I talking about our household pets. He was, uh, he was frightened and he just said, he knew that a lot of people don't live if they're ever lured into the woods with these little people. And, but that's really the premise of what you just said in the intro is these little people tend to lure. And a lot of the locals are aware of this too. So they're very, very mindful. A lot of people won't go out at dark and um, they always have backups and they talk about the little people as real as, again, um, as real as, you know, we know um, Sasquatch is or anything. And they're just very, very attentive of their existence and they're just very mindful of it. 
Oh my gosh. Okay. I have so many things racing through my head right now. So let's, let's focus on the little people and we'll talk about the data from this target. And then let's, let's talk about the other stuff that's going on in Alaska too, because with these targets that I'm tasked with, you know, I'm given a set of blind of, of numbers coordinates and, uh, and I get information. I pull information kind of out of the matrix using my psychic abilities. Okay. Uh, in a scientific manner, uh, writing all my info, the sensory data down on charts and stuff. And, uh, and sometimes, you know, people who task me these targets, they want to see if these things are real. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the case in this target that I was given. Uh, they wanted to see if this was a real creature or a being or whatever they were. And I got to tell you, I do believe that these things really do exist according to this uh, data. Yeah. I mean, I admit when I was, when I went into this, there was these names of creatures that I'm like, what the heck are these? You know, I, I, being from Oklahoma, we have enough things going on here, but Alaska, it's sort of the same, but different names. The natives have different names for them, like the Kushtaka or Kushtaka and, uh, which translates into Otter Man. And, um, so I really just dug into it and, um, started researching more and more. And I, I have to agree with you hundred percent. I think, it gets into how can they exist? Where do they're at? You know, do they live in the ground? And I can't speak on that. I I'm, I'm still learning, but I can say this. I, I feel, and anyone doing remote viewing or understanding remote viewing is you and others. There's other realms that we cannot see with the naked eye. Some people can, I've got a niece that can, I, didn't believe her at first, but I quickly started learning she can real fast. Um, it, it's it's kind of spooky, but I think that these creatures can exist in another realm we can't see, and they will make themselves visible when they want to. Yeah, they're kind of coming in and out of this density, out of this three dimensional realm that we live in into this reality. And I, you know, and people ask me quite often because I'm out in the woods doing Bigfoot field research and we, we stumble across other stuff out there. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's it's not just Bigfoot out there ever. You know, it's a lot of times when we have Bigfoot activity, we're having ET activity out there. We're having UFOs and, you know, we're talking about. I've mentioned this on the show before about maybe they're not, whatever we're dealing with is not totally in this dimension. And no. we had, we have some incidents with what, what I talk about Spearfinger, the Cherokee witch quite a bit. And uh, we, my team has potentially had an encounter with her and it wasn't really in the, all the way in the 3d here. So. Yeah. Uh, well, and we, we come through at, by accident one time going out and doing some research on a piece of property not too far from here, probably as a crow flies, I don't know, four miles. And we went for another reason. And the majority of the data that we collected, primarily 90% of it was um, apparitional. We, mm -hmm. I had an EMF reader that was blowing up all night long. And come to find out we were in a, um, kind of an undisclosed native burial ground and the landowner knew it did not tell us and he wasn't sure if it was for real or not but we came back with hours and hours of audio very clear um, um emfs evps you name it we caught on video evil and again it's in this fourth type of dimension and there, what I caught on video, I didn't actually see. I posted it, but it was the um, subscribers that caught it. And they caught all kinds of this black entity. You could see the head, the upper torso, legs running from me, kind of parallel and crossing the road in front of me. And I missed it. And it was the subscribers that caught it. I went back and I'm like, oh, my gosh. And uh, I listened to the hours of audio. In fact, I listened to some today. Uh, there's some I haven't even heard because we have so many hours over two days. But you never know what you're going to run into. You go for one thing. And if you have enough sensitive equipment or you're in that zone or you just never know what you're going to run into. So it's kind of like you need to be 
your senses. You don't want to be, you know, if you're a hammer, you're looking for a nail. And so if you're going out and you want this data, you need to be more expanded and open. Okay, I'm I'm open to see anything. And that's really kind of the way we're at we're doing it now. Like we can go out for this, but we may see that. I love that. That's the one requirement that I have. Well, I have a I have a couple of requirements, but one requirement for people on our teams is to have an open mind because once you start thinking that you're going to go out there just to go look for Bigfoot, everything is Bigfoot. Okay. And, and yeah. because you're, you're thinking inside that box and if you go out looking for UFOs, everything in the sky is a UFO, you know, but it could be something else. And so you got to have an open mind. I love the way you think Lance. I like it. Well, it's <laughs> when you hunt outdoors, it's kind of like deer hunting. You know, you want the big buck coming in. I want the 12 pointer. That isn't happening. Uh, in fact, the deer somehow know, you know, they feel those vibes, so to speak. And there, there's no deer in five miles from you. And yet you see them when the season is out, you know, they're all over you. So that's kind of the way it is when people yeah. go, you know, I'm going to find one, I'm going to see one. And the likelihood of that happening, I think you're more likely to actually win the Powerball. Um, it's when you least expect it, when you're really not prepared emotionally and it's going to happen. And when you don't have a camera in hand, and that's happened so many times with people, you know, how come we don't have good video? Well, I believe people do have some clear video. Um, but I told you just before the show, I think a lot of these people that have good video and good audio, a lot of them, it for, I mean, they're, there's a lot of emotions that happen, but it eventually ends as being a conservationist. And they go, you know what? I don't want to show this. I don't want anybody to collect this video. I don't want anyone knocking on my door. I've heard about this. I don't want anybody on my property or my mom's property. I'm just going to shut up with it. And that's the hard part to try and talk to those people. You got to be in the inner circle. To oh, yeah. To get to them. Okay. That's 100% true. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I've heard stories of people telling certain, certain like Bigfoot groups, let's just say, about a Bigfoot on their property. And the next thing they know, they have like black helicopters flying over their house and stuff. So I, I can understand where they're coming from. That's a real, I actually spoke at a, an event. I went through some health issues for about since last summer. And so I just kind of took a sabbatical from my show. We'll, we'll be coming back to it. Uh, here this year and um, and I've got some shows lined up but I know there were some people like what happened to Lance and a lot of it was just health issues and I was told to kind of rest so I, I did but I did uh, have an opportunity to go talk down in Texas and I had a well-known very well-known uh, researcher uh, I won't give his name but just before I got on to talk, he said, well, you, I want you to know that I don't believe in this whole men in black and agents coming and corporate spooks and all that. And I said, well, that's OK to each their own. But I'm going to tell you there is real as you and I standing here talking. And I understand <laughs> it's hard to believe that people in helicopters and trucks and all that and cars and all this, but I'm telling you right now, I have off the top of my head, a dozen people that's had similar circumstances. None of them are related. They've not heard each other's stories. They're from different backgrounds, different ages, different parts of the country. The one commonality they have is they've all seen had a Bigfoot either make contact with them, either attack them or damage some of their property or a business, or there's been some level of contact, very close visual of this dog man creature. And that's when these people show up. And in all fairness, I didn't realize it for the longest time, but my phone was the one being actually monitored. And that's how these people knew where these people lived. Oh my gosh. And I found that out the hard way. Um, I, you know, if you want, I can give just one uh, of those 12 people I'm thinking of. Um, I can get, let you know kind of what happened there if you want to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, we, we'll we get to the little people in just a second. This is good. Yes. Because so, this, is, this is real life stuff we need to hear about. And this guy sure. doesn't mind. I give his name, which is rare. I never give a name, but 
He's okayed it. His last name is uh, Two Crows. And he's from Oklahoma. He was from Tahlequah, matter of fact, which is not too far from me. It's a drive, but not too far. It's still in eastern Oklahoma. And he called a couple years ago. And I called him back. He had an encounter with a Bigfoot and its mate and little one. And he was walking. He lives near a major well-known river in Oklahoma. And he had a very close encounter midday. It was calm. It was um, nothing aggressive, but it was a close encounter. And he told me about it. And he was native. And so we talked a little bit about, you know, what the native is culture, what they believe and everything. And he invited my brothers and I, as long as we don't bring cameras or audio, nothing. I will take you on that same trail and we might get lucky. Uh, and I said, great, I'll do it. No cameras. You got my word. Well, about, we were going to do it about a month and a half later, but after we spoke, it was about three weeks later and he called my toll-free number. I still have a toll-free number. It's old fashioned, but you'd be surprised how many people call my toll-free number. And he called back and he said he was upset. I missed the call. He said, never in a million years would I believe you would work with these people, Lance. I'm going to expose you for who you are. I've had more helicopters, Humvees, blacked out um, Suburbans, and ground soldiers with guns than I've ever seen in my life down here around my residence and on the river. And he said, so I, I am very disappointed in you, yada, yada. And it was at that time, I instantly, with some other things that's been going on my desktop, my computer, my phone, I knew that I was being monitored. That was the, that was the, the, the straw there. So I did want to call him back. I knew they'd be monitoring and listening. I started getting smarter and I've got a collection of dozens and dozens and dozens of burner phones. And that's when I started getting smart. I've got box, I've got shoe boxes full of them. I could fill this studio in here full of them. And I didn't want to call him back because I didn't want to know next what was going on. I didn't want to put him in a weird position. So I just didn't call back. Fast forward to about a year and a half, which was year before last. I get a call out of the blue and I answered and it's Mr. Two Crows saying, Lance, I owe you an apology. I know now you're a good guy. You would never work for those people. Let me tell you what happened. And basically, where he lives is typically very quiet, scenic, just it's 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 on the outskirts of Tahlequah. And he said, I don't think they got them. They're smarter than that. I went into the woods at night. They were flying helicopters at night. And he goes, I think they had on the belly of the helicopters uh, thermal. And I said, they typically do. They typically do. Those are going to be, it's an older helicopter. It's not going to be um, any type of Blackhawk. It's a faster, it's a scout helicopter. They fly fast and low. And I said, there's usually open doors on them. He goes, yeah, how'd you know that? And I said, I know what they're flying. And he said, I went into the woods and just started yelling, you got to get out of here. You got to get out of here. And I don't, he goes, I think, I know they can understand. He said, I ended up eventually leaving. We sold our place and I live somewhere else now. And I'm not going to tell you where. And I said, that's fine. He said, but I don't think they got him because I found evidence where they came back. And so he said, I'm just sorry that I thought you were worked for them. And I said, no, I see. He says, why don't you call me back? I said, well, I was concerned that they were still listening. And had I talked to you, I didn't want what you told me to be used against you or anything on where you saw them next or what they were doing or whatever. And um, so I let that play out. But that was just one of like, I'm going to say a couple dozen, but I can think of at least 12 off the top of my head that that very, not exact circumstance, but very, very similar happened. And it's gone as bad as um, one of my friends. He's a friend now. He had monies extracted out of his bank account, savings account. It was closed. He lost his job. He lost his truck. He lost his marriage. And his cousin that used to be like a brother, it split them up. 
and it was repeated. When he, when I did a second interview two years later, his bank account was closed again. That's how oh, bad they wanted him to be quiet. And that, and these people aren't your friend. This is serious. Okay, this, I, I, I just want to let the audience know this is going to tie into this target tonight. And Lance has no idea. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. This is actually going to tie into this target because we're, we're talking about potential, and, and I don't want to just say government. We're maybe like agency of some sort. Well, what they some are sort of agency, are, right? They are government. You know, everybody knows this, but our government makes nothing. They're very good at spending our money, but they make nothing. So what they do is they have contracts with corporations. The corporations are the bad guys. They pay the money to the corporate, and uh, corporations have former military retired or currently active, but they migrate them into these special operation units regarding whether it's certain types of cryptid creatures or whatever. And they're regional. So they live, you would never know it. I'll put it that way. They live in areas like we do, but they're regionally based in each state. That's how they can be on the scene really, really fast. Their helicopters don't come out of major airports like Tulsa International. They're actually in smaller airports, smaller hangars, little townships, and they have their helicopters in those places. And they use helicopters because they can be stationary in the sky. They don't want a Cessna or a Cub Piper. They want something that can isolate and hover, and it already has all the military equipment already on it. So they use, in my opinion, they use smaller, very inconspicuous little town airports that they can pay the manager or the owner quite a bit of money to keep quiet. And they have to sign this is for entertainment purposes. I don't mean to interrupt. This is for entertainment purposes only <laughs> tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. Okay, can I ask you a question? Do you do you think that they are just monitoring the cryptids out there or are they exterminating the cryptids? Both. I think mm -hmm. both. Now it, that leads into it, it, I don't get to talk about this this often because the last time I talked about this, there were some weird things happen on the feed. Is it coincidence? It could be. But I'll just say that I think, in my opinion, I think that they do monitor. I don't think they have a handle on them as much as what we think. We give them too much credit that they're really on the ball and that they are all knowing when they're really not. The only thing that separates us and them is that they have a lot more expensive toys. They can operate outside of the law. They don't have to follow the constitution. They can do things. They never get, they'll never go before any Senate hearing, go before a court and they can do things to our bank accounts and we never know who it is. And they know that if they want to shut us up, they can stop the money flow to pay our bills. And mm -hmm. that's what what's going to be important to us is paying our bills. And we're going to shut up on the cryptid stuff. I mean, that's just logical. Then you lose your job. And then now you're really, I mean, it just kind of flows real mm -hmm. fast. So I think that they do know roughly they monitor YouTube. They monitor TikTok. They'll monitor phones. They've got phones that are already monitored right now and people don't know it. They monitor probably police scanners. I know they do. Uh, ambulance scanners, police scanners. Um, and here's the other thing. They do have people in various stages of law enforcement, sheriff, game wardens, highway patrol. Not everybody in those divisions know about this, but there is few select people that have this backdoor portal of a number. All they have to do is dial the number. Hey, I've heard. Sheriff, Sheriff Barnes, um, Osage County. Click. And all they have to do is say something in code. We got a brown cow down. Osage County, Sheriff, Sheriff <laughs> Barnes. Boom. So that happens. And that's why I tell people, this is my personal. People can disagree and that's okay. That's why I say, be careful who you talk to. Be careful, be careful, be careful. Yes. Uh, hey, listen, I, 
I've been knowing about this for a long time and people have no idea how dangerous it is to be a cryptid field researcher and to top it off to be a remote viewer as well. Okay, so I, I have actually, Lance, I have gotten a proverbial knock at my door already. Okay, and, and I didn't talk about it for a while. Uh, and I still don't talk about all the details here, okay? But, yeah, and, and it's, but it's dangerous. It's scary. And it can be scary. It and a lot of people, the ultimate question comes down to this. Lance, why do they care? Why would they go through all that trouble right. to, to take your money or to make you lose your job? And see, they don't, they don't care if they ruin your life. They'll go home and eat, sleep like a baby. The thing of it is, is that you, you have to think, why do they do this? Those creatures have to be a real because if it was just a like a, a normal indigenous, you know, like a, a mountain lion or some animal, well, call the game department. Hey, cage it up, move it around, you know, boom. But it's not. It is a highly intelligent being that they see either as a and this is my me talking either as some level of a bioweapon that they can use for mm -hmm. whatever purposes, they see that it either if, um, substantiates um, the Christian doctrine, in other words, Nephilim, things like that, beast, revelation, it substantiates that. And I think that they do know where, how they travel to a certain degree, but I don't think they have a handle on each and every one of them. And that's why that they monitor the airwaves, social media, everything. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Okay. So you and I have not talked about any of this data before we went live on air. And I have to tell you about this cryptid in Alaska. A lot of this data in here has to deal with mon being, uh, monitoring and government cover up. It's actually in the data, and it has. And by monitoring, I mean I believe that they're, they are, known of, and they are monitored. They are watched. Uh, I was getting data about gatekeepers, and I don't know. I, I was. I didn't know whether to to analyze that data as like these cryptids, the little people in Alaska are mon or are the gatekeepers or there's someone who's gatekeeping the information about these things. Okay. But this is a, this is a big deal because this happens with all of the cryptids. Now, I mean, we can also go into conversations all about, you know, the, the alleged cryptid breeding program that I keep hearing about. Okay. I mean, if, if that's a real thing, which I believe it could be, uh, that would well, mean that. It's the same. If you, if you look at what's exploded over the last couple of years, it's been before the Senate, um, panel committees and everything, like with Dr. Greer, uh, UFOs, UAPs, right? So take whatever's going on with the, the UFO um, issue and just move it over here with the creatures and cryptids. It's the same. In fact, I feel that, you know, when you get into corporate government things, when government and corporate get together, you got a mess. But um, a lot of money spent, but you get what's called this compartmentalization. You don't know who's running the show. And it's so compartmentalized. My suspicion, what Lance thinks, and I've thought about this for hours, is that I think that they will have these teams of people that specialize in keeping control and keeping down the presence and actually collecting and understanding of the little people. The Kushtika in, in that region of Alaska. Then they've got other teams that worry and, and, and monitor and engage and collect and kill um, the Sasquatch or Bigfoot in this part of the United States, in Midwest part of the United States, this dogman creature and different types of other types of cryptids. And so it's very much what's happening in the UFO arena, except we don't hear it in this cryptid arena at a government level like we do. And I think the reason why is that Dr. Greer's done such a good job at bringing everything out. He has a lot of data, paper records to substantiate what he's talking about. And I've got yeah. data. People make fun of me because I'm always like, let's look at the data. Because <laughs> I, mean, I, that's what it with my remote viewing, I have data. Okay. And that's so. what you really need to, to, to really substantiate you know it's not a matter of that i'm trying to prove they exist i know they do 
what we're trying to do, a lot of people, is bring it forward to see because there's a lot of money being spent on these corporations doing what they do. And, and my rub is that they've ruined a lot of people's lives by uh, removing their pensions, threatening them, coercion, blackmail, threats. Um, I mean, it goes on and on and on. So that's the part that rubs me wrong is that they do this and we're in America. And a lot of these people didn't ask to see this creature. It just happened. That's right. That's right. Well, that's most people that see cryptids. It is by happen chance. Okay. They don't, they don't go out looking for them. I mean, I, I go out looking for them. I chase them down and they chase me down. And, uh, and I, but I choose to do that. Uh, but most people don't. And it's life altering. It, it can be very traumatizing for people, even with these little people out here in Alaska. Uh, before we go further, I want to thank everybody for the, um, for the super chats and the super stickers that you guys have been putting out in Bigfoot, Michigan, Rob, thank you so much for um, gifting the the memberships to my channel. You guys, y'all, y'all, everybody can become a member if you'd like of the channel. Thank you, Rob. Uh, and thank you. Addicted to knowledge 39 and Amy. I appreciate y'all so much. Uh, now we do have, um, okay. A, as you're talking about all of this, I'm looking down at my data and I actually wrote down, okay, some, some of the, the information that I was pulling from the matrix out of blind numbers, okay, coordinates that were just a set of numbers. I wrote down government watch list, that's on here, monitor watchers, gatekeeper, cover up. And then I actually wrote, well, I, I wrote down cannibals and lost tribe as well, is what I wrote down, cannibals and lost tribe. I don't know if these things are cannibals or not. I've not heard that. Um, well, that was part of, yeah, that was a little bit of the story that the, um, not the guy at the airport that I talked to, but when we were in, um, Juno, we were in Juno and I had an opportunity, I talked to a guy and he talked about, I asked him, I said, well, what's their purpose besides getting you lost? The little people that is, he said, well, he said, I think they lure you to the point when, when you fall down, either because of hypothermia, they consume you. Ooh, that's that's what he that's that was the ultimate fear of the little people is that they'll lure you in and then they'll surround you and kind of cannibalize you. They, they and um, and, you know, when you get into other creatures like the skinwalker or Wendigo, uh, you they it's kind of the same premise. You get lost. It lures you with song or, you know, uh, whispers of your name or things such as this. But then when you go into the woods, then you metamorphize, you, you go this metamorphosis in which you become the Wendigo and they become back to the original state. And that was kind of the premise that they have with, with, with that creature. Wow. It's almost like a shapeshifter kind of deal yeah. going on. Yeah, it's yeah, exactly. That's exactly what they were discussing. Um, but, you know, I think back to the Kushtak or, or Kush, Kushtaka, depending on who, who you talk to on the enunciation is that, you know, the natives would always explain things with what surrounded them that they knew and they saw. They saw, you know, wildlife all the time, otter, beaver, raccoon, deer, elk. So I saw a picture today of literally an otter head on a Bigfoot body. And I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I, hey, I'm, anything is possible. <laughs> Um, but I really think that the description of Kush, uh, Kushtaka, Otter Man, is that the Bigfoot had black eyes and brown hair like the otter. And so that's just what they called it. They, the closest names that they knew of in everyday life. Yeah. Well, it could be an, like an aquatic Bigfoot, right? Because yeah. we hear about those quite often. It could have been in the water. Mm -hmm. eating, getting fish, uh, eat some of the, the plant life on the side of the shore. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah, it could be. We've, we've looked into the Kushika here on the channel. That was another one of my targets. And, it, and, and there's a type of siren, actually. They kind of are like a siren. They lure people into the water and then they drown them. They, sometimes it sounds like people that they know. They're, they're a shapeshifter as well, or they could be. Yeah, so. it's it's very likely. And, and, and each kind of tribe or each um, township has a little bit of a different flavor on things, 
regionally too in Alaska, just like they would like in Oklahoma. Uh, that's no different. I mean, here we don't call it Kushika, but we, uh, you know, with Bigfoot uh, years ago down in Three Rivers where we had a lot of our experiences, I actually talked to a logger who drove those roads back way back in the day before there was any highways and they called them boogers and they actually informed the loggers part of their training besides logging and being safe was don't hit the boogers down there. Leave them alone. You'll see them on the road. You'll see them cross the road. Just leave them alone. They'll leave you alone. And it was so such a commonality that the supervisors gave those instructions to the log, the, the logging uh, guys. Wow. Oh my gosh. We have a booger holler here in Georgia. Uh, anytime there's a booger holler or something like that, you know, there's Bigfoots down there in that holler, right? Down there in the mountains. Uh, actually in Rome, Georgia, we have a booger holler. My family's from there. Part of my family. Okay. So yeah. Yeah. Boogers. <laughs> and some, some of the old timers in these small towns, they have these vapor lights that come on at night, you know, automatically, mm -hmm. the, they call them booger lights. Oh, well, I'll be, I'm going to start calling my, my uh, outdoor lights, booger lights from here on out. I like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, it's, it's really interesting when you start talking to an older generation about what they saw. And I mean, I've heard, I don't know. I, I've done, I don't know how many interviews now, but maybe 1500. And I probably still have about 2000 phone calls, you know, people calling the toll free number. And a lot of the people, I would say the majority of them are older than 55. Mm -hmm. And so the, it's just really hard to get a hold of those people because they're not so tech savvy. Um, they know how to do email maybe, but a lot of them, you just got to get in those certain circles like we talked about, and then you're just going to have your mind blown. Um, but getting back to what you said earlier, that I do think that these corporate spooks, and I'll just use the term that Dr. Greer says because I, it, it fits it perfect. Um, I don't, I used to call them MIBs, but that's giving them too much leverage in a way and I, intelligence. And they know a lot because they have a lot more high tech toys. They can monitor people. They have, I mean, there's different types of software. FBI has their software that monitors people. There's one called Somex um or dabble and that's how they monitor that's how the fbi monitors all the uh, social media is that that software system and of course mm. they work with google quite a bit but the the advancement of the technology and monitoring people is a lot further than what you and i have access to right now so you can only imagine what it's like whoa this is well this is all just very relevant because of these targets like because uh, this is my remote viewing show this is every thursday night we do the remote viewing targets and something see i i'm, I'm pay, paying attention now to patterns in a lot of these targets because i've been doing this for a couple of years now and in all of these targets a lot of them it's government cover-ups it's monitoring it's things being watched, things being tracked, some of these cryptids being tracked and being collared and having like monitoring devices on them and stuff. So <clears throat> it all makes complete sense. Now I have a question when it comes to the little people, do you think these little people in Alaska could be responsible? Because I did get in my data here. I, I didn't go over all the data by the way, but I, I probably should do that real quick. Uh, so for some of the sensory data, I'm going to go through this for the audience real quick. I got, so if you're wondering if they, where they live, if they're in caves and caverns, for some of my, my initial sensory data, I was picking up on something deep under, lost, hidden, scurry, attacked, danger, and sick. That was my sensory data for this target. And the, some of the first things I wrote down for my analytic overlay were underground, lost tribe, cannibal, I wrote down Hannibal Lecter, okay, but um, but I was picking up on a scout. So so here's in in danger and stay away. I heard I kept hearing stay away, sickness, fully aware. So I wrote down fully aware government watch list, like I already went over, mm -hmm. monitoring watchers, gatekeepers, and so it, it went from being like it, it didn't really describe the way they look or anything. I'm just excited this data lines up with what the target is, <laughs> okay? Yeah. Um, that makes sense to me because I feel that even in the um, the Bigfoot community, Sasquatch community, whether it's in Oklahoma, and I'm seeing some people there with uh, some of their um, 
super chat here. Uh, Pennsylvania is a huge one, by the way. I see there was a young lady there, Trista. Uh, Pens- I've got stories coming out of Pennsylvania of the dogman creature that's just my- one of the most mind-blowing encounter stories I've ever heard by a security officer and his team was out of Pennsylvania. Um, so it makes sense to me getting back to what I was getting ready to say that there are scouts that it makes sense because another name Sasquatch, the day watchers, I believe that they do have a scout. Um, I had a nephew that saw one duck behind a cedar tree midday, just one, but it was midday. And, uh, you know, we don't think midday, usually it's nighttime, nocturnal, but they are watching. And I think that there's people uh, there, excuse me, the, the uh, Sasquatch, just that creature, um, that being, well, they have scouts that go out to monitor. So why, yeah. why not the little people? The little people have them too, because that was in the data. Okay. And, and like I always tell the audience, it's just data, but I got that from a set of coordinate numbers. Okay. So um, in the process of the remote viewing session, but, but a scout, so, I mean, that, that would be like someone to lure the, the people out and, uh, and then they get, they get jumped on probably and attacked. Now, we have a huge missing persons problem in this country. Oh, yeah. And all over the world. And, I, and that's one reason that I really like to do these shows because I, I do help locate missing people sometimes with the remote viewing. Um, I look into cases that are going cold. You know, I'm, I'm tasked with that. I don't talk about those cases on air, so they're not public. But I look into these things and the majority of the time that people are deceased. OK, but there are some a lot of cases we don't, we don't know. I mean, it, we're talking about millions of people at this point have gone well, missing. I mean, so many people are gone missing from just Alaska alone. Well, and that's true within that uh, triangle. It's kind of like an isosceles triangle from Juneau to Anchorage and Barrel. There it is right there. Um, it's over 200,000 square miles of the most beautiful treacherous frozen tundra you'll ever meet including uh, you've got alaska wolves that make your typical household dog look like a uh, a, a tiny boxer and then you have um brown bears which are typically bigger than grizzlies and then you've got uh you know just a lot of different animals that so and within things started really happening in uh, about October 1972 when you had uh, the U.S. Representative Boggs and Nick Beseech. They were in their Cessna plane and they had an aide and the pilot. So there was four people and they just completely vanished. So you've got people from the air just their plane. I don't know. It's just vanishing. And then you have people on the ground. So from 1972 to present, you have close to about 20,000 people. And if you look annually, the number of people that are missing in Alaska, it exceeds our national average by four times more people missing in Alaska than in the typical United States. And we have around 600,000 people annually in the United States that go missing. And if you think about that, that's a lot of people. Now, they're not all missing because of creatures and cryptids, inclement weather, um, bad people, kidnapping, a lot of things that are just human induced. We know that, right? But there is a percentage that we just scratch our head and we don't know why these people are missing. Now, when we say people missing, we're talking locals, people of the area. We're talking people that's used to flying in inclement weather. Uh, people that know lay of the land, hunters. I mean, I'm a bow hunter. I've been hunting since I was five years old. So I know how to take care of myself. I know what things sound like, look like, smell like. But we're talking people that are very experienced, that should know. They take everything you're supposed to, gun, fire starter material, food, compass, and they just vanish. And they have a family. There's nothing weird in their bank accounts. Nothing's going on and they just vanish. So there's something else going on. And of course, people, if they read the uh, Missing 411 series with David Politis, you collectively, when you start reading that, you realize there's a pattern. You talked about patterns. There's patterns. So what are the two ages that tend to have a high incidence of missing? Kids 
and elderly. Never pick berries. Okay. If you've, yeah. ever, if you've read the, the missing 411 yeah. David Politis, it's, it's always it's people going to pick berries. And, and Fred in Alaska, our friend Fred Roll has told talked about that before, where a lot of people who have Bigfoot encounters are picking berries, salmon berries. I remember specifically salmon berries. The Bigfoot's like the salmon berries, I guess. Now, there, there seems to be a, a the, the, the Bigfoot sightings and the missing people and the cave systems and the deep underground military bases, they all coincide. If you put the maps on top of each other, they all match up. So you know, there, there's a lot of things that match up that something called meridian lines mm -hmm. also, you know, match up to these areas. And a lot of people will say, Lance, what ultimately is going on in Alaska? You know, this triangle, <coughs> excuse me. And it, <clears throat> is it vortices? You get all this this magnetism, this weird magnet um, electromagnetic shifts, you know, with uh, a lot of the instrument panel with uh, aircraft um, is these uh, portals is dimensional things coming in play here. I remember, you know, I'm going to I'm going to be honest, you know, when I heard about portals, I would go, what, what you know, but after doing a lot more reading. <clears throat> looking more into which we can get to later if you want. I had a lot of talk with a um, a demonologist, and he um, <clears throat> is a police officer, and he's a uh, ordained minister, and he was on one of my shows, and we talked about things like that because if you want if you start going out in the woods, you got to know what you're looking at and how to back out. So we started talking about different things and start talking about this fourth realm, this dimension which led into the portals and things like that. So it kind of really expanded and opened my mind up quite a bit. <clears throat> oh, Lance, I got it. Okay. So you and I just met. Okay. We just met. Uh, my team has actually documented a portal and we sent people into it and it's on video and they came out of it. And so we'll, we'll talk about that. I talk about it so much on my show. We'll, we'll, I'll talk to you about it later, I guess. But yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we, we actually did in one of our research areas, we call it the Skinwalker Ranch of the South. Uh, and uh, and so we we have that what we believe to be a portal that the environment actually changed when the guys walked into it, uh, and they and then they they knew they're both trained they're trained in remote viewing but they're also former military and search and rescue guys uh, survivalists they knew when the energy shifted that they needed to back out so they backed out like you just said about learning to back out and I think that's the only reason that they came out of that thing alive because as soon as they their heat signatures reappeared, it shrunk down and then it floated away or it, it disappeared. Yeah, they'll, they'll, you'll have also, as you, you know, you'll have an absence of time. Oh yeah. Because these oh, yeah. portals and, and this is the one thing that really kind of is associated to in coordination with when you go start talking UFOs and things, this loss of time, because our sense of time is linear and space and time actually are one and the same. Everything's happening all at once. And uh, so uh, an absence of time is probably one thing, too, that seems to be when people go through these portals. So getting back to what we we're just talking about, all these missing people, I think it's a number of of just un inclement weather. I think some people just because of the inclement weather, they, you know, or they kind of lose their sense of direction in the expanded wilderness. Um I think unfortunate accidents happen. They don't know the trail as good as what they did. Things happen. And when you're out there in the wilderness with other things that can eat you, um, you don't, and you don't tell people where you're at, you um, tend to perish. So those make sense to me, unfortunately, and bad things happen, accidents. But still, there's a percentage of people that I truly believe that these people, uh, these crypt these creatures are responsible for abduction and as well as running into these portals that they just, you know, and they, there's just, the trail stops cold. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my gosh. Yes. I, I, I could talk about this all day. I love, I love talking about portals and, uh, and just having an open mind. See, I, I see how open you are to all of this and it just makes me happy because there's, I, I think that now that I've been in this field for so long, it took a while for me to meet other people 
you know, because I didn't have a show always, you know, and I didn't talk about my research very often, but my team was going out in the field and we were experiencing so much high strangeness and things like these portals. And we didn't talk about this. I mean, it was like five years before we went public about the portal stuff. Okay. Well, uh, that's it, stuff that we held taboo. on to. It, it's taboo. It, it, in in mm-hmm. other words, we're always, everybody wants to be liked. Everybody wants to be respected and have a level of self-esteem. And I get it. I, I totally understand. And when I started having the show, I was still had a practice. And, you know, my wife said, are you wanting to do this show because people may think you're goofy? And I said, well, I was adamant. Listen, I saw what I saw. I heard what I heard. I smelt what I smelt. So they can call me what they want, but I, I've seen it. So as we've had the show, my values, my I've learned not to be closed-minded. You're going to miss out if you're closed-minded. You've got to be more open-minded because you're going to miss something so beautifully wonderful and mystical and mysterious. It'll be a head scratcher. But if you're already closed-minded, you're, you're really going to miss the boat. And I have learned to read other materials. And it amazes me how you can read remote viewing. You can read um, something with UFOs, UAPs, get into Dr. Greer stuff. And then it all has a way to connect and give you better answers. And there's a book out by Susan, Susan Pinkerton that talks about your ideas or your ideas and mine are mine. But when you and I get together, it forms new ideas, better ideas. And so those is, that's kind of what we want and need in this community, I feel. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we just need open minds. And, uh, and, and I love learning from people like yourself that come on my show. I'm always learning and I soak everything up like a sponge. And with my little bit of knowledge that I have from my field research, uh, it's almost like we're activating each other. Okay. It, dare I say, it's like activating things that are dormant, like maybe a little memory that we had of something that oh, happened sure. to us at some point. And your information can really sp- put me in a whole new direction and my information could put you in a whole new direction. And that's why my, the people that I bring on my shows, especially my friend, Barry Littleton, uh, he and I work like that off of each other because he has all this uh, book research that he's done and and he's been out in the field a little bit, uh, but I'm a straight up field researcher and uh, we just are able to really meld and really take the research to the next level between the two of us. And I think that is so important. And that's what everybody should be doing right now. Yeah. Field. And, you know, everybody, you know, that watches yes. your show and everything is that it's OK if you don't know a lot when you get started. We didn't. I mean, I knew hunting because it was comfortable to me. Right. Um, and I'm still learning to a certain degree. But you start with what you know. If you want to get involved, I always say get involved and hooked up with a, a group that no one has to know anything. But I would say when you start going out being a field researcher, some of the most important things you should do first in my opinion, first is you've the, the bugs bit you, but you need to know wherever you're at in your region or location, know what's in your woods, know what kind of indigenous animals are out there. What do they sound like? If, if they did, very rare, but if they did something attack you, what would you do to protect yourself? Um, did I call someone? What do I have on my body to protect myself? Um, what's going on? I mean, you know, know the lay of the land and the topography. And so start with that first and then kind of work your way up and graduate and then go with a group that's maybe seasoned. Um, And it's okay. It's okay. Everybody starts somewhere. Yeah, they do. Uh, We Barry's in the chat. I was just talking about Barry. Hey, Barry, he's done videos on the little people. You guys go go check out his YouTube channel too, y'all. And uh, yeah, I, gosh, this is amazing. Um, you sound you sound like me because <laughs> I, I say the same thing. Uh, everything that you just said is stuff that I'm always saying to people like because uh, people are always asking me like, well, I want to get into this. You know, I want to get into big footing. Where do I start? Where do I go? What do I do? Um, well, I think and it's important for people not in these organizations. Don't be so intimidating. You know, um, don't speak over <laughs> someone's head. Uh, and that's part of why I'm writing a, a book that, you know, it, it just starts from scratch from someone that doesn't know to all the way up to an advanced person is that, um, you know, you know, for these groups, be, be generous to people, 
that that are just starting out and they're excited and help them kind of lead them by the hand and you know uh you never know what they can offer for the group you just never know that's right yeah you never know don't ever turn your nose up okay and uh and just be open just like we're open-minded about the research um yeah i mean because everybody's on like a different level and some people are just waking up and realizing that bigfoot is real <laughs> okay oh yeah uh, some of us have known for a long time okay yes. we've all known there's it's, it's yeah. as real as you and i <laughs> right now it's uh and the the thing of it is too um it's not always going to be like the encounter like uh, Mr. Uh, Two Crows had, which was very <clears throat> benign. It was very, I don't want, it was friendly. There's been some encounters that I've done on interviews that have been just damn scary. And I'd, I will say for, that's rare. First of all, that's very rare. Thank goodness that's rare. But there's been a few. And so that's why I say, um, be careful what you wish for. Be mentally, emotionally prepared, which is going to be very hard to do, but you always have to, that's what we do when we go in the field. We've seen some, we've, we've seen what we wanted to, but it was an unexpected time. We go at night out in Western Oklahoma and we called using uh, Wiley Dave's dog man call he made in which he had an encounter in 2003 and we've seen at a distance thank goodness it was at a distance but it still scared the the jeebies out of us <laughs> um so we do it at night and we have a technique we use with the light for uh eye shine without spooking we got a bunch of coyotes and bobcat but you never know what's coming up that's the thing that is kind of like uh you know we're, we're each talking to each other and we have night vision Oh yeah. Yeah. We have, we have, we've been talking about big cats here on the show lately. And, uh, and I was given some re remote viewing targets of s alleged dog man attacks, you know, like out of North Carolina actually was one of them, uh, the Brenda Hamilton case. And there's some out of ten East Tennessee too. Uh, but even with the bow hunter out of Texas, uh, a lot of time, not, not every time. Okay. But a, a couple of times that I've remote viewed things like that, it was actually a big cat according to the data. Okay. It wasn't like dog man. So you gotta be, you gotta be aware of what is in your environment and stuff. Now the, the Alaska, to get back to the Alaska triangle, I was thinking of something that crossed my mind as you were talking in that triangle. They say that the wildlife is much more violent against humans in that triangle. Now, do you think that it ha could have something to do? This is just my hypothesis. I think it has something to do with harp and all this weather manipulation that's going on up there because there's some sort of frequency. I think there's some sort of frequency that is being given off by some of these weather weapons and some weather manipulation stuff. There's no telling. I think that, I wonder if that could be part of what's going on up there. Well, we know animals are affected by, just like humans, right? We're affected by magnetism, the, the pull of the earth. We're affected by frequencies that are not natural. We're affected by chemical, and, uh, you know, uh, whether it's airborne or things that we consume, we, you know, f sustenance, foods. So mm -hmm. we know that over time, you know, other countries have subjected uh, our U.S. embassies with high level frequency and it changes our demeanor, our emotion. So why wouldn't it be with animals? So in this area, I've heard very similar, just a little bit of that when I was there, but it, I didn't have anybody really explain it to me a little bit more. So I, I didn't really catch on to it and dig more into that or question, but I think that it makes sense to me. So if there is yeah. something chemically in the air, why wouldn't it affect an animals uh, or something frequency magnetism? Could it affect their emotion or behavior? Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's making them mad. It's pissing everything off up there. It's pardon my French y'all. I'm sorry. I don't well, usually say the bad words. And, but and when you it's get making them mad. Yeah, when you get into such an expanse and wildlife like Alaska, it it's kind of the mentality, everything's bigger in Texas kind of thing, except it's much bigger in Alaska. And it's feral. It'll eat you. <laughs> yeah. And so you can imagine if it's got an attitude, you better be on guard. And so that's why I tell people be emotionally mentally and physically prepared for the unexpected kind of like a boy scout or girl scout right you just mm -hmm. be prepared 
you got to practice these things. I mean, so if someone, this is just me, right? Our team, we, we pack heat everywhere. That's just, we're open carry here in Oklahoma. So we comment, we practice everything. Uh, we practice with our rifles. We have different calibers for different reasons. We actually load our own ammo that's special. We, we practice. So you don't want to get out of practice. You got to be thinking, I, you don't need to be paranoid, but you need to be knowing what things look like, sound like, and like, hmm, that sounds like a bobcat, maybe. Let's hear it again, you know. You don't need to, not everything is a, a, a Bigfoot walking in the woods, right? Not every, every star is a UFO, but still, I think being prepared as much as you can, you'll have a better time. And, mm-hmm. and you never know when someone comes new to the group, they can offer um, some technical skills, some tracking skills. Uh, who knows? So that's why I just love having new people come to groups. Yeah, me too. Listen, we're all trained on my team. Well, I'm not going to say everybody, but a lot of us do carry firearms, you know, because of the things like the big cats and the feral people and, and the serial yeah, killers. I mean, the number one <laughs> things like that. person that you, the number one thing you have to be concerned about is a human being still. Right. So, and then the next is the most common, which is going to be indigenous dogs, rogue dogs, feral dogs. Um, I'm not so much worried about feral pigs. Uh, they, they look nasty. They look prehistoric, but actually there's ways that you can circumvent around them. They, they don't, they don't bother us. Uh, they're pretty easy to take out, but most of the time they want to run away from you, but it's usually feral dogs. Um, that's, um, uh, we've encountered a couple of wolves, um, and, uh, we've encountered bears, but they, they run in Oklahoma. They're, they're nowhere near as big as Alaska. But um, uh, of bears, the number one attack, uh, of bear attacks, usually it's black bear. And that's what we have in Oklahoma. It's still rare. It's still rare. But I believe you should become acquaint, acquaint yourself with the firearm. That's my two cents. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Laura, thank you so much for that super sticker. I appreciate that very much. Yeah, we got we to gotta always take precaution. Now, okay, when you were in Alaska, did anyone ever bring up the Black Pyramid or the Dark Pyramid? It's, yes. It's, they, okay, you know, the, what do you know about that? Well, the film company that was, I didn't get to do that section in the film of the Black Pyramid mm-hmm. in the mountain, but someone else had that information that was filmed in the show, and they did uh, talk about that in one of the episodes. I can't remember which one it is. But they talked about the Black Pyramid and that it was uh, it was in a mountain, and that within that mountain, it there was it was it was massive, and this pyramid was almost like a uh, glass-like structure. It was it was uh, it was almost like a it was obsidian. obsidian. It was like was obsidian. It, a- it was like obsidian. Okay, wait, can I, can I, inter- I don't mean to interrupt you, but I've got to tell you this. So I was, I was, that was a remote viewing target that I got and, and t- another remote viewer did that as well. And we both uh, picked up on obsidian on the outside of whatever it was we were, were, were remote viewing. It was a shiny black stone kind of thing. Yeah, obsidian is formed with extreme high heat. <laughs> it forms a glass in, in volcanic rock. So, and a lot of Native American uh, arrow points prehistoric were made out of obsidian. Uh, it's real pretty. Uh, but yeah, that's what it was. And I got to read a little bit of it, although that wasn't my section to read during the show. Someone else had that task, but it was in a remote section of Alaska. I mean, out in the middle of nowhere. And it was within a mountain that had plenty of space. And okay. that it had some type of uh, energy ability to it that it was uh, had an infinite amount of energy. So if anything was to ideally, they thought, hover over this mountain and be stationary, you could recharge a system, a craft. Okay. Do you want to hear something really cool? Yeah. When we were remote viewing this. So my friend Tanya was remote viewing it in Idaho. And I'm down here in Georgia and we both had separate targets. Well, we got the same, some similar data to this pyramid. I mean, I was picking up that it was like millions of years old or something. It was like super, super old, ancient. 
Now she was picking up that it not only was, and we both picked up that it was a power source, a power generator. And so she was actually picking up that it was not only the pyramid going up, but there's a pyramid the same size going down into the ground and powering something underground, like a huge, a huge area. I don't know, maybe the whole entire inner earth for all I know. It was a lot. Um, it so it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, again, so many things relate. If you follow a lot of what Dr. Greer talks about and a lot of his documentation from people that are the whistleblower, so to speak, they talk about these uh, zero point energy sources that are not nuclear that have can drive, provide an infinite amount of energy for almost an infinite amount of years. And so uh, it wouldn't surprise me if this was an extremely high tech, I mean, way beyond what we could even do, high tech energy source that can recharge other high tech crafts or whatever, an infinite number and going down into the earth. That wouldn't surprise me either. It wouldn't surprise me at all. Oh my gosh. I love it. I love all this confirmation that we're getting tonight uh, on these other things that we've looked at. So. It's amazing. We were actually both picking up too that it's heavily guarded, too. Yeah. So, well, anything that we kind of you hear through certain circles or something just kind of weasels its way out into a crevice, out into our community or on the news. It's in another part of the country, England, that finally squeezes here in the U.S. online. You can bet they've known about it. They being these corporations that are affiliated with our U.S. government. The government pays them the money, billions, right? And then these corporations, um, they are excluded from testifying. They're excluded to release information what they're doing because it's like a private entity. And so that's how you, there's no Freedom of Information Act with these corporations. That's only with the government. Uh, and then if the government is covering up the money, how do you know where it's at? Who Who's doing what? But, you know, if Dr. Greer says that we're doing business with over 200 different corporations, top secret, top, top secret black projects and operations, then would they be guarding something like that? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> heavily guarded, heavily guarded with lots of researchers, scientists every day finding out and reverse engineering how all this works. Okay, so this is this is so this is so cool that we're talking about this tonight, because I got okay. So I, I I've been doing I do targets all the time. Okay, and uh, for one target that I got recently, I'm not going to give it all away because I'm going to go over this target. I don't even remember which one it was, but I was I I get I do like deep mind probes on when I pick up a person in the environment and stuff, and I can I get messages when I'm doing these and I got a message and this is so fitting to t talk about this right now. <laughs> and I was wondering like, why did I get to get this message? I got the message in one of these targets that every single cryptid that you could possibly imagine is already identified and known by our government for the most part. And, uh, and there's an active, there's an active, uh, I want to say program to keep it all covered up. Uh, so that we don't know, but they're all monitored. They're all watched. Okay. And that actually kind of crept into this target. Okay. About the Alaska little people. Uh, but this was on a, a separate target that I had done. And I remember getting that message and I was like, well, it was just an odd download for that message for that, for that um, target that I was doing, but it was a cryptid target. Uh, but it was, it was like the message was that every, everything is known and it's monitored. Okay. So yeah, I would, um, I, Probably about five years ago, I wouldn't have believed that, but <laughs> no, you no, know, it's it's a matter of that which is the craziest we can think of right now is possible and is reality, and so I am so more open minded than I was before after reading certain materials and having a lot of these very odd and strange things happen to my computer. Um, I could go on and on, but when I would interview guests and they said, why did you call me back last night? And I didn't, but someone talked to them using my phone number and asked them very interesting detail questions that I would never ask. And they wanted to know why 
I would call them back. Did I not believe them? And I said, it wasn't me. And, and the person was baffled on anything. I knew what had happened. So, but it's, it, it, I didn't want it. I was jumping too much ahead of time. They just saw a creature to tell them, oh, by the way, there's these corporate spook, you know, it's just too much. It's kind of like I told uh, one guest that had some terrible things happen to him after having a, him and his cousin were attacked by a Bigfoot up in Ohio. I, he was trying to just verbal vomit everything to his family. And I said, listen, you're trying to feed them an elephant. You have to do it spoon by spoon. You can't shove it down their mouth. It's too overwhelming. They weren't there to experience it. You were. You don't have to convince me. You can talk to me, but to tell anyone else that's not had an experience, it's just too hard to convince people. So that's why I said, like, my show, it's not about convincing people. It's about talking to the people that's had those experiences already and help them through that. Yeah. Those are the people that really need someone they can trust. And what do I do next? This happened. What do I expect? What can I do? What, you know, what's the next plan? And so, but are they being monitored? Absolutely. And that's why I think it's compartmentalized teams doing this. Yeah. And and that's why I think a lot of people personally that I know don't talk publicly about their research. It could be very dangerous. And, uh, you know, I, I personally, like I, I did used to work in government. It was on a state level. Okay. But it was within women's organization. So, you know, it wasn't like wasn't working for like the Department of Defense or anything over here. But um, but a lot of people that I know in the field, by the way, are they do work for the Department of Defense. They do work as, you know, uh, contractors and are current and former military. And they are fire chiefs and they are, you know, just working in, in I don't want to say elected officials, but, um, you know, in, in some sort of public service, let's just say. Yeah. And you um, don't you don't have to be in a state or federal government to be monitored. I'm not, I've never been, uh, I mean, I've chiropractic for 25 years, you know, but where they get their underwear in a bind is when you start saying they don't like when you have paper trails, if you have paper trails and I'll just give you a quick example. They freak out over this. And then now they're, you're on their radar. That cousin, I was talking about these cousins, the Ohio Bigfoot attack and Fed cover up I did. That was one of the big shows that kind of really started our channel. Um, when the cousin that had his rib broke from the Bigfoot that hit him and he broke ribs and it punctured a lung, he was in the hospital, the local hospital. And in that hospital, while he was in there, they had the highway patrol, the sheriff's department, the wildlife and game department, and they had these two guys that came in that cleared the whole room. They weren't wearing a badge, but what they told the other officers is they instantly, everybody got out of the room. So they held some weight and they talked to the cousins. I won't get into it because it kind of gets real lengthy, but I'll just say this. The cousin went back two weeks later to pay for his bill at the hospital. Guess what? What? No records. No, no records of him ever being there. No records of an ambulance drive. No records of any condition he ever had. No bill. No records. And the lady. Well, that's good for him, I guess. Well, no bill. he didn't understand. It was upsetting. He goes. I was here. What do you mean? I was in that. I'll show you the room I was in. And he goes, what? So he went, he didn't understand. He didn't put the, the domino pieces together yet that there's other people because of what they saw and what happened. They were attacked that there was other people that was monitoring and took care of everything. And so they want to cover it up. So anytime you have paper trails, they don't like it and they don't like it when you're, you immediately talk to people like me and you. So mm -hmm. we're on the radar. So this is where I've gotten a little more creative and people can talk to me and I'm not putting them in jeopardy. Yes. And I, I can appreciate that. Cause on your shows, you, you, you show yourself. Okay. So you don't, you're not hiding your face by any means. No. And so you're, you're out there people, uh, you are a, 
you, you're a very trustworthy person from what the shows that I, I watched and everything. I know you and I just met today. Okay. But I like your vibe and I can tell that you really have your heart in this and, uh, and really do mean well for people. And we're all just looking for answers. And it's almost like a support group here at the Cryptid yeah. Hunters channel at least. And I know your channel too. Yeah. And that's really what it is. I mean, that's a good word. It's, it's a, it's a support group when there's really not one. And that's when I started the channel out. I wanted it, you know, being in healthcare, I've treated, I've been privileged to treat thousands of people over my career and I'm just naturally wanting to help people. And I knew, I knew certain things from a lot of experiences from the interviews that I could help a person. This is what's going to happen next. So you don't do this. This is what you need to do now. You need to do, or if they had issues going on in their part of their property, I would give them advice on what to do when it comes to uh, trimming the property up. They kept having visitation, knocks on windows, slaps on houses. And so I couldn't be everywhere. I, I was at a point at one time where I was getting 30 to 40 calls a day from, Dang. and I, I couldn't keep up with it. It was literally like a call center. And I, I was just overwhelmed and, um, but it was a support group and I learned a lot and I learned that a lot of people want answers and there's, uh, they're really not into the subject matter. They're just like, I saw this thing. It scared the hell out of me. I don't want it here. What can I do? And you get that. And then you get people with multiple encounters. Um, it goes on and on and on, but anyway, um, yeah. I, I like to, I like to say that we are the disclosure for this stuff. We are the disclosure. We're the ones putting the information out here. We're letting people tell their stories because do you think that we'll ever get full disclosure from them, if the government? We do, if we do, that's a great question. We, I've been, I, I appreciate a lot of people have come to me, uh, not on the show, but at a couple conferences, and they said, you need to be our, you know, voice in Congress. And I said, well, I, I appreciate that. I, I don't, uh, if we do get disclosure, I think it'll be indirectly. It'll come through the disclosure of the UFOs or UAPs, like through Dr. Greer. He's got so much documentation, some are not disclosed. It is still top secret. And when you have top secret documents like that, you can get into big trouble. I mean, just look at Julian Assange. I mean, yeah. you see what's going on with him yeah. right now. And so you need to watch your P's and Q's. You need to have people on the inside helping you. I don't have a lot of, I mean, I know some people, but I don't want to say I know people, you know, that's deep on the inside or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I don't. I, again, I'm just a regular guy that has put a lot of things together directly and indirectly enough to help people that kind of makes sense. But I think at some point in time we will, but I think it's going to be kind of an indirect thing rather than a direct thing, unless something happens that is hundreds of people around. I mean, doesn't, where well, you just can't collectively, these corporate guys can't uh, quarantine you and, and, and shut the uh, verbal traffic down. That is going to be, that would be a circumstance that it would get out. Okay. I have, okay. So I have something that's kind of opposite of what you just said about it's going to take a UFO researcher to put out Bigfoot stuff. Well, I, I have, okay. Disclosure wise. So me and my friends, some of my research friends, we're we're Bigfoot field researchers. But one of my good, good friends has a video of an actual orb turning into a, an ET, an alien. And it shot down from the past the, a camera in somebody's backyard, turned into an alien. It was an orb. And it ran around. You can see it running around the yard, turns back into an orb and it shoots past the camera. We're like we're Bigfoot researchers, but we can, but he's got this video. I mean, this is, this is groundbreaking stuff. And he just released it. We, we were both speaking at the Georgia Bigfoot conference about two, two or three weeks ago. And he showed it to the public finally. Okay. So it's, it's things like that. We're, we're all doing this together. You know, and it's all these different facets of kind of the same thing. Like we're just putting, we want disclosure with a lot of this stuff. 
Yeah, what we need to, to share get it. the disclosure is, you know, at its basic level, again, I'm trying to see what Dr. Greer, they're doing. He operates on a, um, you know, a um, almost a, a investigative scientific level, and he's got documents that is either headlined by a senator, um, a sergeant, someone upper, upper brass that uh, can corroborate that letter and or someone on the inside that said, yes, I worked 25 years at, um, you know, uh, uh, Nellis Air Force Base, Area 51, and I saw what he this paper says. So we need someone like that that has worked at a facility that has a some paperwork that says, yes, I watched these creatures being monitored, uh, had autopsies done on them. Uh, we were aware of their lung capacity and uh, we have a lot of DNA. We've analyzed it. And I actually have some of the paperwork of the autopsy right here. You know, that's what we need. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, <laughs> Dean says, we want the truth and are telling us like Jack Nicholson, you can't handle the truth. <laughs> oh, I mean, and, and that gets into another point. I'm glad that Dane brought that up because <laughs> it's, that's the truth there. There's not a lot of people that can handle this. I mean, right now, I think it's, I'm just guessing, there's a lot of people that can't handle even what Dr. Greer and a lot of the military whistleblowers have come through and what they're showing and saying. It is so mind-blowing. So you can imagine with the creature aspect of it, some of the people that I've interviewed, and some have been police officers, you know, and people of authority and people of professional positions that have had extremely close encounters. They weren't on medical marijuana. They weren't hallucinating or anything. And they saw what they saw. And you won't tell them, any, you know, you won't tell them any different. And I think that that would really blow people's mind. A lot of people can't handle the truth. It's too frightening. It is. And I understand. I empathize with them. Because a lot of people, in my opinion, they just want to go to work, go to the soccer games, pay my bills, and take a vacation and be, I don't want to know about this stuff. And I actually have some family members like that. Don't, I start talking about mm -hmm. this and they kind of freak out. They go, Lance, uh, don't, uh, just, just, can I, can I just not think about, don't talk about that. So, you know, I understand. And a lot of people, it may read them the wrong way because in their Christian doctrine or their faith, they may think that like, you know, I love, I love my mom dearly. She's sweet. But you start talking about remote viewing and about these creatures. She just kind of Lance, Lance, don't, don't, honey, don't, don't talk about that <laughs> because that, that kind of disrupts her faith world a little bit and she doesn't know how to place it. And I understand um, with me, it actually amplifies it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was honestly, it was harder for me coming out as a remote viewer than it was a Bigfoot field researcher. And, uh, well, yeah. and I've, been, I've been attacked. Listen, I've been attacked online. Okay. Uh, by other like, podcasting channels and stuff about my remote viewing, because I don't think they're ready for the, I mean, I, remote viewing is innovative for this well, field. I'm sorry, but it is. Here's the thing <laughs> so. that's really interesting that I found out. When I started my channel, it, it's kind of like, um, I, I haven't seen it yet. There's a new show, uh, Roadhouse, that came out back in the 80s. You know, I, I like it. And, you know, remember in there when uh, he said. That Patrick Swayze. Yeah, Patrick Swayze. When he <laughs> said, when they're, you know, uh, yelling at you, be nice. You know, if they pull a knife on you, be nice. So it's kind of like that was my mantra with the show. Be nice to people. Give them the benefit. Be courteous and professional. But what is kind of comical, yet some level of sad in this genre, especially with podcast shows, I don't I don't get it. I get it, but I don't get it. The people that can be the most vindictive and are the very people in our community. And I, I, I've not understood that, you know, if we're open minded and, you know, uh, it's kind of like in chiropractic. I practice a certain way and there's other chiropractors that go, I don't like that. 
well, that's fine. I feel comfortable and my patients come to me and, but, and you get your patients, you know, and they come to you because you practice whatever X, Y, Z. It's kind of the same thing, no matter where you go. I think people, and this is just my opinion, a lot of people, their egos get in the way and they're very insecure. So I say, do what you feel to do. No one knows all the answers, but we're learning together. Invite new people in, teach them what's going on. Don't act like you know everything because I guarantee no one knows everything. And and you know what? You'll grow, you'll be coachable, you'll learn. And now I'm 57 and I'm more open than I ever was before. And I've learned so much before this last couple of years. So anyway, that's my two cents there. I just wish people were more inviting and more friendly. They are, but you know what I'm saying. Well, hey, your vibe attracts your tribe, right? Your vibe attracts your tribe. That's what I always say. And uh, we got we got the right tribe over here on my channel and on your channel. And uh, and we have people that are just here to, to learn and to grow along with us. Because I'm learning and growing every day. And listening to, gosh, I, I love everything you've talked about tonight is just right up my alley. And um, and I resonate with every bit of it. So well, I, I'm, I like what your uh, Bernard Fox just said, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that is it. You know, that's uh, you, if you're coachable and you'll learn, you will be like a sponge and you'll see things that no one sees. You really will. And when I started being more open-minded, I just, my brothers and I, I mean, we talk about this all the time. Every time I talk to my brothers, this is what we're talking about since 2017. So, and the more that you read different materials kind of within this paranormal area. And uh, I hate that word, but I'm just collectively calling it that. Uh, you start to see things and put things together. And getting back to what you just said on remote viewing, I think it honestly scares people. The thing of it is that when it came out, you know, with Stanford Research Institute, uh, with uh, Russell Targ and Robert Monroe, uh, they were physicists and they had some psychology background. But you know, they were just testing things, but it was so successful. Our government, it went on for like eight, the program went to 17, 18 years and they dumped million, millions of dollars into it. So it worked <clears throat> and it actually helped us behind the scenes save people's lives. It still does today. I actually talked to people who are current military snipers let's just say I, I know a couple of i know some people and uh they have a remote viewer attached to their unit okay a lot a lot of different arms of the military have remote viewers okay i'm just i'm just putting it out there well here's <laughs> okay. the thing i think that bothers people i believe this is just lance's belief <laughs> i believe that we were given gifts by god that we don't we can't explain it. We can't explain it all. And that I believe that we all have that ability. But some people, it comes more natural, just like people are more uh, naturally, uh, athletically inclined, more musically inclined, more intellectually inclined. I think the same thing can be with remote viewing. It doesn't shake my faith. It actually it strengthens my faith that us humans have this remarkable ability it's just mind blowing and that it's saved lives. It's found people. It's helped our government. It really has. And here's the scary part. There's other countries doing it. That's not, well, that, good. it's not friendly. Well, that's, that's why the United States started doing it from what I've been told is because during the cold war, Russia was right. using psychic spies. That's right. So America had to make psychic spies. And so exactly what your, girl, your girl's a psychic spy y'all. I'm just saying. And well, that, I think that's what people fear too, because the people who fear it are the ones that are, that have stuff to hide. Well, sometimes. you fear what you don't understand, right? That's true that's, too. That's just, that's right. humans, the psychology, we fear what we don't understand. <laughs> And so whether it's these creatures, I get it. I don't blame people. It's just damn scary sometimes, especially with these, some of these uh, interactions, what happens you're expect. I mean, that's why we kind of named our channel. You know, we're told as kids, there's no monsters under your bed or in your closet yet. And then when we become an adult, you go into the woods or you're dumping trash in an alleyway that 
uh, is against a wildlife management area and you go out there and you meet something that's 10 foot tall while you're dumping trash. At that moment, you realize monsters are real. And I think that shakes people's world so much so that there's a lot of people that just like, I don't want to know about it. And that's why I've talked to people in a group. Four people in a group see a creature. One person desperately wants to talk to you. Another one's on the fence. And the other two, they're <laughs> mad. They want you to don't even ask. Get out of my face. Don't ever ask me again. And that is a very, very real collective kind of a psychological uh, evaluation. That's what happens a lot. And it's just, it shakes the world so bad. And that's what happens with remote viewing. People don't understand it. So they get it away. That's, 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 uh, that's witchcraft stuff. Oh man, I've been called that before. Okay. And it's, again, yeah, people, <laughs> it's weird, but the, but the guy, see, I, most of my team, it's like 99% men. Okay. Or like 95% men. And those, those guys aren't getting called witches. Why am I the only witch out of the whole crew? <laughs> Well, it, it, it's, it's easy to call someone name rather than understand them, right? right. That's it, true. It, it's easy to deflect and call someone a name or get agitated rather than sit there and going, what do they know? What is it again? Can you, right. can there's something I can read that can help me understand what you're talking about? That's a person that's inquisitive. They, right. they want to know more. Uh, they're what, uh, you know, um, Jordan Peterson calls a true kind of philosopher and intellect. I want to know how the world operates. What am I missing? You know, does it shake his faith? No, no, not Jordan Peterson. You know, so I look at it that way. And, you know, there's so many good books on that, but I, um, I've got to be, you know, even within my family, like I said, I start talking about this. A lot of people like, Oh, Lance, you just, can you be quiet? Um, but I love the Lord. We rely on it. I can tell you, we've gone into some burial grounds that I did not expect what we saw on camera and what we heard. And I'll tell you this, after I got done with that one incident, that fourth realm is real. Evil is real. Mm -hmm. And when you start getting into some of these people in these corporate what we were talking about, these black projects, and you start getting into the people that run the show at a government level, they're into some wicked, dark, deep, satanic stuff. Oh, God, yes. that That's really coming to the surface right now, too. There's a lot of Satanism in our military at the oh. highest points. And, it's, and, it, and, and so we talk also about the rituals and, and actually even conjuring cryptids. I have cryptidville in the chat today, my buddy, Mark, no. and we did a show together on conjuring cryptids and, and what it, you know, people do conjure them and, and using rituals and blood. And, and a lot of times we even have, you know, on the civil war battlefields down here in the South, there's a lot of cryptid sightings, a lot of ghosts and stuff. Well, there's all that blood in the land and there's, I, I think there's something to it. Well, when you start talking about, I had that, um, that demonologist on who, who is, a uh, he loves the Lord. He, he worked as a security guard in a high level psych ward, like, uh, the movie silence of the lambs. Oh, he worked ooh. in one of yeah. those. He worked in one of those. And so he saw some crazy stuff, but we started chatting, made a really good show. Uh, I had him on twice. I think I did four, four shows on him. Um, and the thing that I learned is that there are very high people and with some of the stuff in the news, you know, you got to take it with a grain of salt, right? Cause our media is right. all over the place. I say our media <laughs> media is all over the place, but at a political high level and at an entertainment level, there is some dark, scary magic going on. And when you, and when I say mad, I mean, satanic stuff. And when you get into that level, remember the, the union of opposites, whatever God created that was good, they're going to take it upside down that same thing and make it bad. So perversion, um, all kinds of stuff, you know, Epstein Island, that whole thing. And, and I, what I learned from that demonologist was this. 
any time that they go through rituals, you hit it just a moment ago, you said rituals. Mm -hmm. There's always rituals involved and there's always blood involved because mm -hmm. we here in church, there's life in the blood. Christ sacrificed himself. He bled. There's life in the blood. Well, they turn the blood into something horrific. So there is some very scary rituals going on out in the woods, too. Out in the woods. There's some weird oh. stuff out in the woods. And that's why if people come up on an area that's got weird symbolism and things hanging from trees and strings. Blair yeah, Blair Witch Project stuff. Right? Yeah. No, if you do, don't touch anything. Back out and just don't touch anything. You need to, it's, you know, you need to, and this is what we do. Uh, we've not come across that before, and I, I hope we don't. But we always say I, uh, we blessed our firearms and ourselves every time we go out. Every time. And uh, we started doing that after that, that burial ground incident. That, that was pretty hair raising. It, it shook my brother Lane up quite a bit. Um, but um, it's real. That's the scary part. It is. It's real. And you don't hear people talk about it a lot, especially in church. Who goes to a church sermon? They're talking about um, this third realm and dark entities and, and you know, uh, satanic rituals. No one, you know, that's not a very uplifting Sunday, but it's real. It's all around us. And if we don't talk about it to know, to help people, you know, if you see it out in the woods or you, you know, you, you got to talk about it in order to understand it in order to stay away from it. Yeah. You know? I mean, my, my team has gone up to places where yeah, I'm just going to say unaliving is because of YouTube, YouTube, of course, but where people have died um, horrifically. Uh, at a place that these two gentlemen were actually Satanists and they were friends with Anton LaVey. Uh, well, this area is in North Georgia and it's, it's right beside the Chickamauga battlefield where, you know, 34, 32, something thousand men died over three days in a battle. And there's all these like cryptid sightings there from the old green eyes to werewolves, um, dogmen sightings. Of course there's ghosts up there, but it's a very evil feeling. And the last time I was up there, there was blood everywhere. I mean, of course we found out what it was. It was a, a kid who had cut his leg. Okay. But he, they do rituals up there. You have to watch out for these. Yeah. I mean, cults. everything resonates. Everything has a resonating mm -hmm. frequency. We learned this mm -hmm. really basic in eighth grade physics in, in high school, right? Everything has a resonating frequency. Solids are less, liquids are more, steam is much more. So our bodies are just temporary, but our soul, our spirit is a very high level resonating energy. It lives on. So anything that has turmoil and, con and discontent and just horrific deaths like that, especially war, war, your things are going to resonate at a frequency that's like a magnet to bring other non-pleasant entities in. And that's what I learned when I was talking to my guest. It's like a magnet for this area. So is it no wonder you find these creature cryptids sometimes hanging around? How about these dark shadow people uh, and just a whole slew of negative things? It doesn't surprise me. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's, I'm always telling my audience, keep your thoughts positive. Okay. Try to get on a high vibration. Okay. Try to, but I, it's just so important to like deal with our traumas and things like that, because we don't want to be, when you're on a lower vibration, you're more prone to getting attachments, negative attachments. And you're talking about the demonic realm and that, that is very real. Okay. With the well, yeah, witchcraft it, it and the Satanism and the rituals and all that stuff. Uh, it's a, that's a very low vibe in my opinion. Okay, it is. It's, it's, it's a, it's a very low vibrating frequency. And it, again, this could spin off in so many rabbit trails of talk here, but that's, it, it does have a level of uh, going into the remote viewing and for people through a prayer and meditation. And so we know in healthcare, I used to read a lot of research papers when you feel good, it's hard for a happy married couple that just got married to be sick. 
I know that sounds silly, but their really? immune system is operating great because they love each other. Love is a very high, a high vibrating frequency. And I'm not talking weird stuff here, folks. I mean, I'm talking things that we know that now we can prove things. Um, and this gets into quantum theory and things like this of have our, uh, you know, if, if we've got something we can't kick off our mind and we can't forgive somebody or whatever, that starts to lower our frequency. We know this stuff now. Um, so you, you said it, you know, you've got to operate on if, if you, if you just have a mindset of being open, being thankful, you'll see a lot more. You'll hear a lot more. You'll understand a lot more and your mind will be open, you know? So it's, uh, it's easy to say and hard to do, you know, with me, it's just right. time, you know, uh, but we all have that ability. We really do. We do. And we all have the ability to be psychic. Okay. We have every, everybody, we're all in this together and we all, um, yeah, just get on your highest timeline, shoot for your highest timeline, everybody. And, uh, and try to stay positive. Okay. Good vibes only your vibe attracts your tribe. Oh my gosh. This has been such a fantastic show today. Oh my gosh, Lance, thank you so much for being here. Uh, yeah, let's, absolutely. I mean, so, so we, we were talking about the Alaska triangle, but we've talked about so much more. Everything is so connected and, uh, and I can dig it, man. I can dig it. This has just been great. Yeah. So. There's, you learn a lot in, you know, since I've had this for 17 years and then I read a lot outside of various things and trying to piece things together. And sometimes at first I don't know it's going to piece together, but in writing the book, it's taken so long because I keep, it's not that I have writer's block. I have so much to talk about. I'm trying to tie it in. I keep adding to it. Um, <laughs> I just need to finalize it and be done with it. But um, everything has a way to connect. I'll put it that way. Everything. So what's going on with UFOs, uh, the UAPs, you know, the they're calling it UAPs because they want to get away from UFOs. Um, but that pay attention to those stories because it's very much in relational to what we are talking about with creatures and little people and Kushtaka and everything else and Bigfoot and Dogman and Mothman and Ram Man and all these things, because the organizations that's been keeping the UFO quiet are very much affiliated, if not the same, could be different compartmentalized organizations that are keeping this creature cryptid being quiet, these hominoids. Exactly. Uh, it's it's just all one big animal out there. I mean, I don't mean the animal is in cryptids. I mean, the animal is in they. No, oh, yeah, <laughs> right, right. Is yeah. In whoever they are, and I always do the air quotes, you know. Well, we don't um, know. I mean, that's a good point. I, I think there's, in my opinion, there's not just a dozen. There's, uh, I don't know, somewhere, I, I, I would say in the thousands. You know, Dr. Greer said it's close to, there's close to um, about 900,000 people that has top secret clearance in the United States. Top secret. Now, that's, you have to think, that's recorded what we know. In other words, we can go online, we can do a search and find it. But that's of the U.S. government top secret. What we're not saying is that the corporate, that's a whole nother entity. How many people have black, black top secret clearance? Mm -hmm. We don't know. It's, they won't. We're not supposed to know. Yeah. So, see, that's the part we don't know. There's so much we don't know. And um, I mean, I've even been working with with people who are in the chat tonight, too, as a matter of fact, who have been part of the secret space program. OK, yeah. so the it, it, we don't have a rabbit hole here at the Cryptid Hunters channel. We go down a portal, OK, uh, with a lot of this. And we have people who have experienced these things firsthand, just like on your show. Um, yeah. And, and we're putting it so out. Much, so much going on. It, it is overwhelming because just you could put all these subjects on a dartboard and just throw a dart and you can talk about that for the next year. There's so many things going on that it really, in order to get the good perspective is watching shows like yours and mine and, and honestly read, read, and you'll start seeing things that you've never seen before. Like 
I never thought that was going to connect, but it did. <laughs> Something drove me to order that book and read it. And now it's making sense. Wow. And that's the way it's been. I mean, I can't, I've got a, I don't know. I've got a library of over 10,000 books and I just, I reread some of the ones I've read before and I just get it from, a, I get a new idea from the one I've read three times. Yeah. I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've read Quantum Bigfoot by Ron Moorhead. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's my, one of my favorite books. Okay. I mean, and, and all these, all of my friends, all the people that come on my shows, even our friend, John Vendaventer. Okay. That's who introduced you and I, and uh, shout out to John, by the way, with the relics book series. Um, I love John's books. Okay. And I, I love getting the, you know, purchasing books from everybody uh, who I meet and I, and I interact with, because we're all just exchanging this information. Like I said earlier, it's, it is doing something to, what do you call it? What's that word that I use? Um, we're, we're getting, well, activating. I guess we're like activating. Is that what it is? Like we're getting downloads from each other and we're activating. Something else is activating You're inside of Yeah. Us. And, and you could call it, we're expanding our consciousness. Because consciousness is, we're all expanding our consciousness together at the same time. Even, I know this sounds kind of odd, even if we don't talk. That's right. Just our collective thoughts together. Now that gets into a whole other subject matter you can read on. But <laughs> um, again, this was kind of like whoosh, over my head. Uh, my brother Laren is kind of like the expert on this stuff. And we talk, and what I've learned from him, just our conversations, we talk every day, is just mind-blowing. And he's in the process of writing his book. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think that a way we can bring this to light, all these creatures and cryptids, little people, everything, whether it's in Alaska, Oklahoma, or Georgia, is really getting more information that's solid, not only in the field, but people that is in the trenches of these corporate and they were, they have paperwork. Now that can be a bit dangerous on their part. So that's, what's really hard. You, you got to be careful. And I don't have a, a great plan on how you could protect them. That's my, that's the problem. Um, it's taken years and years and years for Greer to get where he's at. And he's got people on the inside kind of protecting him and the whistleblowers. So we don't quite, the cryptid, this community doesn't quite have that level of organization yet. We have these shows, but we don't have dozens and dozens of high level retired brass and senators that, because this subject, as it was with the UFO community, it's taboo. And to explain a creature, if you've never had an incident, is going to be kind of hard. Well, you know what? Okay, so you got my my brain working tonight. Okay, so I, I actually worked with a whole bunch of lobbyists here in Georgia. And I, and I worked with all the legislators. I used to have to go beg for money for my job because I, I, we were always having to get funded by the governor every year. Okay, and, uh, and so what if people like myself got out there and started kind of lobbying. And I'm not mean like lobbying as a lobbyist, but like putting it out there, writing letters to our legislators, okay, our state representatives, our senators, just on a state level, even on a national level, federal level, and say, hey, we we need to put out some legislation to like we where we want we want the truth. Let's have disclosure. Let's say that you know Bigfoot should be a protected species or something. Like what what kind of steps should we take? Well, uh, just to start off grassroots wise, that's, this is where it gets a little tricky and it, it's not, the trickiness is not going to be in doing that. That won't be that hard. It just takes groundwork, you know, boots on the ground and handshaking and all that. That's, that's really not that hard. The problem that I see is that it will definitely put you out there. And you'll, your name's going to get around. And my concern is that if it gets around so much, you might be on a radar. Now, I still go back to thinking how we're really going to get some meaty, convincing um, paperwork. Because that's what it requires. Yeah. You know, 
it, it's going to require someone that was in the inside that saw. And by the way, I got some paperwork to prove it. I mean, it, I think that there's a lot of people in the inside that have seen. Oh, I know they have. And so, yeah. but you have to think when you are read into these special black programs, the watchers are being watched. If you think you get to retire, go fly fish, you know, sit back on Monday, you know, and Wednesday and Saturday and fly fish. That doesn't happen. You're always being watched. So they watch who you talk to and you, you're you known about when you're read into these special black projects. You're It's understood you know this. And you have to be careful. If you start yapping, I'm telling you, people... Just follow some of Greer's stuff. People die. And so, I mean, I hate to be harsh and direct like that, but just follow a little bit. Again, see what's been going on in the UFO community for the last two or three decades. People, senators that's wanted to come forward and talk, guess what happens? They find mm -hmm. them in a river. Um, yeah. So if there is a way we can get a handful of, of people at the same time with paperwork that said we were together our job was to do this and this so the bigger you make it and more open don't keep a secret openly disclose it i agree with greer openly disclose it then we can have something we it's tangible and then we can say okay we can take you guys and we can go to the field researchers who's got nails hair poop video this, 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 we have, we have this to cooperate this. And then you can form a more powerful team and a committee. That's right. just my opinion. Yeah. Well, we're working on it. In the meanwhile, we're going to keep on talking about what we're talking about on our shows. As long as, as long as I'm around, we're going to be talking about these things. And yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, it's just that uh, I've learned that you've got to be a couple steps ahead when you do things. Um, but sure. I, um, I think people should go with what they feel comfortable with, but know that there's, there's other groups out there too, you know, oh, yeah. and that, uh, anytime you have direct paperwork that proves somebody was hurt or was attacked, don't talk about it. <laughs> just keep, a, keep hold. I mean, that's just Lance's recommendation. You know, keep Good it, advice. put it secure, put it in a safe, make multiple copies, put it on thumb drive, give it to some people you trust and just don't talk about it right now. Just let things kind of calm down and then uh, you'll know when the right time is to bring it out. Yeah. I may or may not have people sending me stuff pretty often and I don't, I don't put it out. It's not the right time. I think somebody in the chat, I think it was Robin said timing is everything. Okay. It really is. Timing is everything. I've had people send me uh, the most unusual things, uh, cables that are snapped. I've got maps that people made of where they had their encounter in really remote areas. I've had, uh, I tried to get a car door of a truck that was smashed in by a Bigfoot and um, I know they probably listened to that. That that was one of the guests that got called back at midnight saying it was me and it wasn't me. And uh, that door was thrown on a pile in the back of this semi truck company, this transport this transport company. And uh, the owner, I said, I'll take that door. That's what I told that guy. So he went to the owner. And he said, Hey, I got a guy. I know it sounds crazy, but he wants that door. You know, and I was willing to ship it or go get it. And lo and behold, the next day, there was two people from the insurance company that loaded that door up and they had the official shirt. I've worked insurance for 25 years. It was Jake from State Farm wearing his khakis, huh? <laughs> that was the first time. Insurance people don't care about a busted up door to put it, to put it in their car. What? No. They took the door and the owner said, well, someone took the door. And the guy I was talking with, Chris, he goes, what? You took the, what? And he goes, yeah, they wanted the door. I mean, the guy didn't know any different, but I know insurance companies working with them. They don't care about a door. They just want to take a picture. It was, you know, it can't be dry, you know, and the check that was remitted 
the insurance company said they didn't remit the check. What? The, the owner said, so well, suspicious. you paid me money. And they go, no, we didn't. He said, yeah, you did. So they were on the phone 20 minutes. And finally, the lady on the insurance representative said, listen, sir, did you get your door replaced? Yes. Did you get your money? It didn't come from us, but did you get your money? Yes. Okay, sir. What do you want me to do? And he hung up and he was just puzzled. So I told this guy to tell his boss kind of if he feels comfortable, kind of the gist of what was going on. But anyway, I collect, I collect stuff like that. And that's why I was wanting that door. You're going to have to open a museum one day. Okay. With all that. It's just like things. Zach Bagans with his I've, ghost I've museum. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I knew yeah. Talking, yeah. <laughs> it, it's, I've yeah. got some unusual things. Wow. Cryptid related too. Oh yeah. I mean, oh yeah. Yeah. I'm things impressed. No human can bend, break. Yeah. It's just mind blowing. Well, I'm loving it. Oh my gosh. Well, these are amazing stories. Thank you so much for sharing all these stories with us tonight and, uh, yeah. and all your encounters and your knowledge and uh, just everything. This has just been awesome. We have actually gone two hours on this oh, show. Wow. I wasn't expecting that. It went by, it went by fast. I know. So I don't, I'm not going to keep you here all night. Cause I know um, I'm, you know, we got, we got a lot going on you and I both. And, oh um, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I'll, uh, uh, I'll be getting some shows on here soon. I promise they'll be good. I'm going to make mine a little bit different than they used to be. Um, like I said, I got my health back doing well. I was told I had to take a break. And um, so everything is going really well. Um, and I'm ready to start getting back. And we're going to be doing a lot more in the field stuff. Um, and I hope it'll be interesting for people um, uh, to try and get the It'll be like an interview that I do, but in the field more. And we're going to be staying in very secluded places. So whatever happens, happens. So you're you're in Oklahoma. Are you planning to do your show in Oklahoma or are you going to travel? I would like to travel, but um, even though uh, my kids are grown, my wife and I, you know, we're just here with our dogs. Um, just because by nature, I'm kind of a homebody. Um, I like to read a lot. I like to, uh, my wife and I go camping out in remote areas with my Jeep and, uh, and no, I'm not allowed to do any calls or anything out there with her. It, she knows no about what I do, but it, I don't share everything cause it kind of is scary, you know? And I, again, I, I don't blame people. Uh, so, you know, when I do interviews, I'm laying in bed all night going, Oh my gosh, you know, she's sound asleep. But, um, I'm probably going to start with a lot of things in Oklahoma since I'm very familiar with the state. And there's there's so much going on in Oklahoma. There's so much going on in Georgia, Tennessee, Kentucky, Texas, Kansas. I mean, just start in your backyard. There's something there. I promise you. Tell me about it. Yeah, this Georgia is my backyard. And um, we have more Bigfoots here in Georgia than any other place I've ever researched. We've got a ton of Bigfoots up in those mountains. They're, they're in the mountains and they're on, they're places that you would never guess. They're in the open plains, dirt plains of Oklahoma, where the, where the, mm -hmm. where our tumbleweeds are at. They're out there in the night. And there's people <laughs> that won't go out of their home at night because they're out there on those open plains. Red Dirt Cryptid said, uh, no using your wife for bait, okay? <laughs> yeah. No using your wife for bait. That's not a good idea, fellas. Okay. Yeah, she unless she, she unless she mind, volunteers, she doesn't mind going. But a, a little thing that I've learned, and this is for anyone that goes out, um, where we were at when we would have our experiences at night, which was quite often every year, we did not leave lights on in camp. It was just pitch black, and we almost every night had some event happen, multiple events. <laughs> When we started leaving the lights on at night, so in new areas that we weren't familiar, so we'd camp usually in the same spot every year, but we would kind of move around within that area. We would turn our lights on. Um, we didn't have a lot of experiences. That's why we don't use flashlights very often in the field. Uh, we, we usually don't use flashlights unless we've got some people that are kind of decoys and we're sending them out. And then the rest of us will stay kind of behind and not turn our flashlights on. Uh, so we get, we get more activity that way. Yeah, people, you will. I, I, that's, a, that's a pro tip. 
Yeah, we learned it uh, just, you know, trial and error. It was kind of by accident, really, because we have some people that are getting older in our group as some friends and they wanted, they didn't want to trip because they went outside to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. And so we <laughs> leave the lights on. And then I started noticing we didn't get a lot of, we didn't get tarp lifting on our tent tonight or poking and things. We, we literally had a lot of uh, very close things happen. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, there's nothing worse than having a bunch of Bigfoot activity or something weird going on outside and you have to get out to pee in the middle of the night out of your tent. <laughs> Oh, that's know. not fun okay trust me some of the guys i know they'll they'll put a little anyways a camp toilet in their tent if they got a tent okay some people i you know it is what it is but oh it, yeah it that's why you know <laughs> when my wife and i go it's lit up like a city <laughs> she, yeah. yeah it better be lit up with led lights with about five thousand lumen I mean, oh my gosh, that's the same with my son. If I take my son out camping or whatever, we, we keep it very lit up and, oh, and safe. Yeah. We actually sleep in the back of my truck uh, with, and it's a forerunner kind of thing. So, oh. you know, it's SUV. So, uh, so we're safe and we lock the doors when I've got my kid out there. So, oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, safety measures, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, this has been amazing. Can you tell the audience? I know my, my moderators have been putting your link up in the, in the chat, the entire show, but oh. tell the audience what your channel is. Okay. Well on YouTube, it's monster nine one one. And then, uh, on Instagram. Now I admit I haven't updated a lot of things, but I will start updating it. Now I had, a um, the film company was kind of helping me and so they they got busy, and so now I'm going to take it over. But on Instagram, it's Monster911, and then on uh, Twitter, which is not Twitter, it's X now, right? Right. Uh, let's see. Oh, it's Monster underscore 911. Let's see, 911. I'll type it in, and we'll put it up there for the audience to see. Okay, so that's at it. Monster911. Okay, great. All right. Well, everybody, please go follow Lance and his team, man. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to, to you getting on there and doing some more shows and stuff. And uh, I've got a lot of shows to catch up on uh, on yeah, your channel, they, even though you've been gone for a couple months here or a month yeah, or it's it's however long it's been, uh, it's been longer than that. <laughs> it's been close to a year, not quite but close. Um, I, I, I was doing shows every week for years. And I was trying to work at the full time and I went to, I retired and then I went to another job. I was trying to help some friends out. And by the time I got home, it was 9 PM. And so to do an interview, I, I used to have interviews that go till one. Well, I'm still fairly fit, but I couldn't stay up till one, then get up at five. Oh God. I just did that on Sunday. I had a spaced out radio show. I got done at 11. I didn't go to bed till almost one. And then I had to be up for an interview with an Australian interview, it was, it's out of Australia and I was up at four. So yeah, it, yeah. that that was a rough day. Okay, rough day, yeah. but I feel like it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> so now I kind of pick and choose what I, you know, I've got to have my rest. I've got to have my Me rest. Me too. Well, I am I am honored that you came on the show tonight. So oh, this has you. just been, you. this has been one, this just flew by too, so. It's awesome. Yeah, um, it goes by quick. It really does. And it does. Uh, absolutely, I, I really appreciate the invitation and uh, uh, those people that uh, I saw some comments down there. That's great. And but yeah, I'd love to come back sometime. Awesome. Well, you're invited. You have an open invite, Lance. Okay. So okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. And thank you to our friend John Vendeventer for yes, yes. introducing John's us today. Guy. He's a great Please guy. Go. Yes. Uh, and where he's where he lives, there's a lot of activity. He's in Tallahina, right? Tallahina. Is he's that how you pronounce it? He's in Honobi. And you Honobi. spell it H O N O B I A. It looks like Honobia, but locals, it's Honobi. And okay, no, I could never, it took me the longest time to pronounce that right. So I still don't pronounce it right. Honobi is how I say it. There you go. So, there you go. Yeah. Well, you guys have a lot of Bigfoot. So listen, you stay safe out there, Lance. And, oh, we'll, do. Uh, we'll do. Awesome. Yeah. And Thank you so much. I we'll be talking it. again soon. Yeah. I want to tell the audience tonight, you guys, please come back and see me on Saturday. I'm going to have a show at 10 p.m. We have Ryan Tremblay coming on. We're going to be talking about the Wendigo and much more. And then I'll be on Space Out Radio Sunday night at 10 p.m. So you guys come see me there as well. All right, Lance. Well, okay. thank you again. You're you welcome. guys, please. 
keep your head on a swivel stay safe out there and i hope you guys learned something because i know i did all right <laughs> Take care. you guys have a great night and we will see y'all next time bye y'all bye lane Baby.